got Zach and Melody on the way in. I don't know where, where is Melody? Is she still here? Oh, there she is. All right, Melody is, uh, she's from Cambridge, Ontario originally. So she's new, newer to the area, came in 1990, sorry, 2019, right? 2019. And uh, so she she's new, very new to the city. I think we're in an area where if you came uh, any time after 1950, you're a newcomer, right? Uh, but what's that? CFA. CFA, all right. Well, Melody came here with her husband, Jack, because they had a dream to have a bigger home, a little more land, and a wonderful countryside upbringing, the kind of lifestyle they had when they were kids. They brought their two children here, and they were able to buy that home. But over the next two years, the cost of living began rising so fast, whether it was the cost of groceries, or home heating, or property tax, all of it compounded, one on top of the other, until they could no longer afford that dream home, and they had to sell it and they've moved to a smaller property with a thousand square feet uh, in order to be able to pay their bills. And this is, uh, this, they've run out of Ontario to avoid the high cost of living. They were refugees from inflation. And they came here to escape it, and then it followed them this way. And uh, we've seen that throughout Justin Trudeau's tenure. We had a 40, 40 year high inflation. The cost of government is driving up the cost of living. A half trillion dollars of inflationary deficits have bid up the cost of the goods you buy and the interest that you pay. And on top of that, the inflationary carbon tax is driving up the cost of businesses and workers to make our goods. Finally, red tape and anti-development laws make it more difficult for our farmers, our businesses, and our energy workers to produce the things that we need affordably, forcing us to import more and more expensive goods from abroad. And that is why uh, so many people are suffering so much today. Making matters worse, the Trudeau government now wants to impose its carbon tax on all Atlantic Canadians, a tax that will drive up the cost of gas and diesel, of home heating, and indirectly of everything that has to be transported using train or truck. It really is a tax on everything. This year, it is expected uh, that Atlantic Canadians across the country are going to pay a major increase in home heating bills. How many of you heat with oil here? Can't afford to. <laughs> so what do you heat with? Heat pumps, okay. Yeah. You can't use your furnace. All right. And uh, how many of you have had to turn down the temperature in your home this year? And it's expected to get worse next year because that's when the carbon tax will kick in on your home heating bills, making it even more expensive and driving up your costs just to get to work or to go and pick up even more expensive groceries. We know this isn't the answer for the environment. Of course, the carbon tax has been in place for most of the country now over the last three, four years, and we haven't hit a single solitary greenhouse gas reduction target. In fact, Canada is now ranked 58th out of 64 nations in its performance on climate change issues. So this tax is not working. You know why? Because we're taxing, they're taxing things that people have no choice but to use. You need to heat your home. You need to drive your car. You need to go and get groceries. Our farmers need diesel-powered equipment to run, their, to, to run over and pull up the goods that they bring to the marketplace. And our truckers need fuel in order to deliver them as well. So as long as we have these traditional energies as the essential part of our supply chain, it is not going to be avoidable to have uh, their use and deliver uh, those goods and our, those services that, that we rely on to survive in this country. The answer is not to make traditional energy more expensive, it's to make alternatives more affordable, right? The way you do that, first of all, let's talk about electric cars. Right now, there's a major price gap between an, an electric car and its equivalent gas-powered vehicle. The reality is many people can't afford one, and if you're living in the countryside, it might not even be practical because of the weather and the distance that you must travel. Finally, the batteries that go in those cars are made burning coal in places like China, which have cornered the market on refining lithium and other essentials. And finally, there are countries around the world that mine that, that lithium in the first place that burn coal and have poor environmental standards. So we're basically exporting our food to the rest of the world when we buy products that are made using high pollution processes. 
The answer here is to, one, increase the amount of clean electricity we have in this country. That means we're going to have to, frankly, double the amount of electricity that is on our grids across Canada if the government's going to hit its target for adding all of these electric cars onto the streets. But you can't get more electricity if you can't get projects built. And right now in Canada, it takes seven to ten years, if you're lucky, to get a major project approved, mostly because of the federal government's anti-energy laws. So what we need to do is speed up the approval of projects like hydroelectricity in Quebec, like nuclear power in New Brunswick, like nuclear power in Alberta and Saskatchewan, so that they can replace coal-fired electricity with new nuclear, clean, emissions-free electricity. We should also be mining our own lithium in this country. We have the sixth biggest supply, but in 2020, we didn't mine a single tablespoon of it because we can't get mines approved with our bureaucracy in this country. So let's speed up the approval of these projects to get the essential strategic minerals out of the ground and into our project products using the most pollution-free processes anywhere in the world. We've got to remove the government gatekeepers, get things built, harvest our resources, and become a nation that stands on its own two feet. Decentralized technology in Alberta, they're burying the carbon back down in the ground where it came from. They have this carbon capture and, and storage technology that exists in Western Canada that they can expand upon. And why not do that instead of attacking our energy sector and then bringing in more energy from overseas dictators? You know, we in this country, we are importing 130,000 barrels of overseas bear oil every single day when we have the third biggest supply of our own. That doesn't do anything for the environment. What we should do instead is continue to incentivize our energy sector to, be, to grow greener, but to repatriate production by allowing our energy sector to flourish and to deliver the energy to our markets. And let's set the goal that within five years we will use Canadian energy and Canadian energy alone and replace overseas oil with oil from Western Canada and from Newfoundland and Labrador. and more renewable energy produced here in Canada in the, in the cleanest and the most responsible country in the world. And we're going to export our civilian-grade nuclear power, our hydroelectricity, and yes, even our natural gas. Our natural gas can be used to shut down foreign coal-fired plants. That would reduce emissions. Let's look at what's happening in Europe right now. The Trudeau government is allowing Putin to have his, his gas turbines maintained in Montreal. And when Putin said he wants them back, Trudeau sent them back so that Putin can pump gas into Europe and use that in order to raise money to fund his war. But why do the Europeans need Russian gas? Well, they can't get it from Canada. We have 1,300 trillion cubic feet of natural gas in Canada. We don't export a single solitary cubic foot overseas. We give all of it to the Americans and often at a discount. Why? Because you need a liquefaction terminal in order to get that gas on a ship and send it overseas. Why don't we have those? Well, there are 15 proposed when Trudeau took office. 15 of these terminals. Not a single one has gotten built because of the anti-energy laws we have in this country. And so, when the German Chancellor came to Atlantic Canada, Trudeau said, hey, don't worry about it. There's no business case for natural gas. Well, nobody told, uh, and nobody told the Middle East that. Because the Qatar signed a deal with Germany just last month to supply Qatari gas to the Germans. And the Germans built an import terminal. You know how long it took them to get it built? 194 days. Wow. 194 days. You wouldn't even be able to begin filling up the paperwork to get something built in Canada in that amount of time. We have the ability to export that gas. We have more, more ability than anyone else. Why? We've got the best uh, location. We're closest to Europe and Asia of all the North American countries, shortest shipping distance. Secondly, we have uh, the cold weather. How do you get gas into a liquid so it can go on a ship? You cool it down. You know, and it gets cold in Canada. In fact, Rick was telling me that it was so cold 
in Ottawa last winter, and he actually saw some liberals with their hands in their own pockets. <laughs> We're going to replace them with new laws that require business and government consult First Nations, protect the environment, but get things built. We're going to cool down that gas, turn it into a liquid, put it on a ship, send it off to Europe to supply Europe with a, an ethical and clean source of, a, of, a, of, of power uh, for their economies. We're going to send it to Asia to shut down dirty coal fire plants. We're going to turn dollars for dictators into paychecks for our people in this country. And we are, as I said earlier, we are going to ax the carbon tax so that your life is affordable and Canadians can get ahead with affordable energy in this country. We're going to control government spending with a new pay-as-you-go law requiring the government find a dollar of savings for every new dollar of spending. That will mean that no more inflationary deficits will drive up your cost of living, will remove the regulatory red tape so our businesses, our farmers, and our workers can produce more affordable goods and your dollar can go further. We know we don't need to create more cash, we need to create more of what cash buys. And that means unleashing the productive forces of our economy. Think of it this way, if you have 10 loaves of bread and $10, it's a buck for each loaf. If you double the number of dollars, you still have the same number of uh, bread. Well, then it's all of a sudden two dollars for each loaf of bread, right? Well, if, instead of that, what if we doubled the amount of bread we produced and had kept the same number of dollars? Well, the cost would go down to 50 cents for each loaf. It's pretty simple. We don't get richer by just creating more cash, throwing more money out the window. We get richer by creating more of what money buys, and that's what we need to do with tax policy that brings jobs back, that produces things in this country, that removes the red tape, and that has government that stands at the side of our businesses rather than in the way. That's how we're going to increase the purchasing power and the prosperity of our people. And speaking of our people, our traditional values in this country have come under attack, especially the rural values. We see this with the Liberal Amendment to Bill C-21. They are planning to ban a whole series of hunting rifles and shotguns. They're going after the Grandpa Joe's rifle in rural Nova Scotia. Instead of stopping the importation of illegal firearms from the United States of America, we know, according to the, to the, the police in, in Toronto, 80% of the guns used in crime are illegally imported from the south of the border. Montreal police will tell you the very same thing. Only a tiny fraction of the packages that come over our border are actually inspected by the authorities at CCDSA. And we don't have enough resources to tackle uh, organized crime and to track the, those smugglers that are bringing in those guns. Finally, it's a small minority of people who do the vast majority of crime. The BC Union of Mayors put out a, a letter to the, to the government there and said that in the city of Vancouver, there were 40 offenders who had 6,000 interactions with the police. The same 40 people. So this is not the you know, the 18-year-old that makes one mistake in his life. It's habitual repeat offenders that are doing almost all of the crime. So what is the solution? My view is that we should not spend billions of dollars going after law-abiding hunters and farmers. Instead, we should use that money to bolster the borders and keep the smuggled arms out of the country. Yeah. And we should, yes. Let's toughen up the laws on the most violent gun offenders, those ones who come in and like, yes. You know, um, it's one thing, we all believe that if a young person makes a mistake, they should be given a chance to get to make it right, do their time, and uh, pay their debt to society, but then get back their lives and get back uh, on the, into the community and into society contributing. And that's possible, we've seen that again and again. But what is not right is to have someone who commits and is convicted of 60 or 70 or 80 offenses continually released, and even when they're rearrested for their next crime, released the same day on bail. 
And we saw the stabbings in uh, Bank, excuse me, in Saskatchewan, the mass stabbings, an incredible tragedy. So the two offenders who carried out that, met, they have been convicted of roughly 60 offenses. They should have continued, they should have been in jail. If they had been in jail, then those people's lives would have been saved. That's where the priority should be, but instead, Justin Trudeau wants to spend our money and his time going after the hunters and the anglers across this country. These are the least likely people to commit crimes. And first of all, to get any firearm in this country, you need to have a possession and acquisition license. What does that mean? You have to be trained, tested, vetted. The RCMP calls your acquaintances and loved ones and says, hey, is this guy okay to have a gun? Then they have to safely store their firearm. They have to follow all the rules on safe transport to and from either the range or to their hunting uh, location. These are the people who are going to follow all those rules and all those steps are not going to then go and rob a bank. And the guy who's going to rob a bank isn't going to follow any of those steps, nor is he going to respect a gun ban. There's not a single solitary criminal in this country that is going to honor and respect the federal government's gun ban. Right? Not one. these lands since time immemorial. For, for millennia, uh, they have used hunting as a form of sustenance. And to this day, there are communities in northern Canada and elsewhere where hunting is a primary source of nutrition. It is not just recreation. It's not just a hobby. It is actually the way some of our people feed themselves to this day. So this new gun ban that Trudeau has proposed would put hundreds of firearms on the list. In fact, so many, they can't even count. Our team on the Public Safety Committee, uh, led by Ra Raquel Dancho, yeah, give her a round of applause. <laughs> Our team, led by Raquel Dancho, uh, asked the question of the government officials, can you please tell us how many guns will be banned by this amendment you're bringing forth? And they couldn't answer. Because the, what they've done is they've put forward a description of the type of guns that would be banned. Effectively, if the firearm is semi-automatic, semi which means it doesn't have to be reloaded with a new round in the chamber after each shot. And if it, carry, it has a um, magazine with more than five rounds in it. Now, the government can't tell us how many different makes and models meet that definition. Furthermore, what they definitely can't tell you is how many individual firearms that represents, because most of these firearms are not only um, legal right now, well, they're all legal right now, but they're actually unrestricted, which means they don't even have to be registered, because it has been thought by previous governments, liberal and conservative, and probably by the police as well, that these were appropriate civilian firearms, and they didn't need even to be registered. And so having no registry for them, the government doesn't even know how many are out there. There are probably widows who have some of these firearms in their basements that their husband used to use and passed away. And the uh, surviving widow forgot about it. Well, she'll be a criminal if she doesn't go downstairs and find that gun and then walk it over to a local police detachment and turn it in once this... How is that going to save any lives? It's not. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to make it clear to you, a poly of government will reverse this ban on hunting rifles and shotguns. So let's continue the fight, my friends. Let's uh, stand up for common sense. Let's make yeah. common sense common in this country, right? Yeah. That's what we need. We need a country where that respects those who work hard, pay their taxes, and plays by the rules. The people who get up every morning, who produce the goods and services that we need, who support our local charities and food banks, who stand up for their neighbors and raise their kids. These are the people who get forgotten about so often in politics. And meanwhile, politicians cater to sensationalist headlines and special interest groups as we've seen with the carbon tax and the rifle ban and countless other issues where the government is taking away your rights and your freedoms. Big government makes for small citizens. I want to have smaller government to make for bigger citizens. I want you to be able to take back control of your life 
in the freest country on earth. That should be our purpose. In the words of the great John Diefenbaker, he said, I am a Canadian of free Canadians, free to speak without fear, free to stand for what I think right, free to oppose what I think wrong, free to choose those who shall govern my country, free to worship God in my own way. It is this heritage of freedom I pledge to uphold for myself and all of mankind. Thank you.